This is C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. This week, a class about early Atlantic exploration, Christopher Columbus and the discovery of the Caribbean and the Americas by Europeans. Northeastern University professor William Fowler describes the ventures of the Vikings, Portuguese, and Spanish. Well, welcome back. Good morning. You remember the last time we met, we were talking about the Portuguese discoveries, the exploration that they made down the coast of Africa, and also the navigational techniques that they developed, the astrolabe and the compass, the ship's log, et cetera, et cetera. And that the Portuguese were the first Europeans to really venture out onto the Atlantic. But they ventured south. They didn't venture west. Keep in mind, too, as someone mentioned in the last class, about the world being flat. Uh, Europeans did not believe that. 13th, 14th century Europeans knew that the world was round. This map, which is not meant for navigation, shows you that this is a 13th century European map of the world. And you might not be able to make out the continents and the countries here, certainly. But you can see that, indeed, they saw the world as round. The question was not how the shape of the Earth. The question was whether or not you could actually make it around the Earth. that they knew, theoretically, that if you sailed west, you'd come to the east. But how far that would be, what dangers they would encounter, none of that was known to them. None of that was known to them. While the Portuguese were working their way down the southern coast uh, towards the tip of Africa, there were another group of people who were pushing off in a different direction onto the Atlantic. And these, of course, were the Norse, uh, the Vikings, as they're sometimes called. Uh, in The common image, of course, the Vikings are seen as ferocious warriors, conquerors, looters. There was a prayer that monks used to offer in medieval Europe, Dear Lord, protect us from the wrath of the Northmen. Well, some of that's true, certainly. But for the most part, these Norse Scandinavians were farmers, sea traders, fishermen. For reasons that are not entirely clear, Beginning about the year one, uh, about, about the year 800, uh, these Norse began to push into the Atlantic. Now, it could have been that there was climate change in Scandinavia that was harming the harvests. It could have been overpopulation. Not quite sure. But for whatever reason, the Norse began to leave Scandinavia and venture out onto the Atlantic. Now, they weren't venturing out as explorers. They weren't looking for new continents. They certainly weren't looking for the route to Asia or to China. But they were looking for other places to settle. And so they began to sort of island hop. They'd come from Scandinavia over to the Shetland Islands, to the Faroe Islands, over there to the Hebrides. And you can see from these arrows that they would come down along the coast of England and Ireland, even into Europe and France. And eventually, of course, some would actually get into the Mediterranean. So they were wide ranging. Very wide ranging. Yeah. In the map yesterday, you said they went to <clears throat> North America. Yeah. Well. yeah. Did they, have they been like, doc- were they documenting this or just kind of going around? Most of our, great question. Where, where, do we get the, where do we get the information about these Vikings? Yeah. Uh, mostly from what are called the Icelandic sagas. And these are oral traditions that the Vikings, the Norsemen, kept and were written down around the 13th century. So we don't have actual eyewitness first-hand accounts of the Norse setting out here on the Atlantic. But we do have these oral traditions from the sagas then written down. So they begin to push out. And again, think of these people as kind of island hopping. Indeed, the voyages that they're making here in the vessels that they had were probably not more than two or three days. So they're not going vast out into the Atlantic. And here are the kinds of vessels that they used. Remember, we talked about the Egyptian uh, vessel and the uh, Greek wart, the Greek trireme, and the Roman warship, and how those vessels, galleys they were, rowed by men, were not really suited for long distance travel or travel on a ferocious ocean. And you can see the Viking longship here is sort of the same way. Not much freeboard. We, we talked about freeboard, the distance between the top here and the waterline. So, rough water would be rough water for this vessel. Relatively small, it's probably about 60 or 70 feet long. And we can see from this, this is an archaeological excavation, by the way. This is a real Viking longship, longboat. And we can see, too, the remnants of a mast here. So these are the kinds of vessels that these Vikings used to sail out onto the Atlantic. Now, where did they go? Well, we saw on the previous map, they went down the coast of Europe. 
Uh, they went to the Faroe Islands, the Shetland Islands, uh, Ireland, uh, Scotland. Well, they also ventured a little bit further as well. They ventured first over here to Iceland. And again, the journey from the north of Scotland, or the Hebrides Islands, or the, or the uh, Shetland Islands, the Faroe Islands, towards Iceland is not all that far, three, four hundred miles maybe. The Vikings began to notice, you might ask, well, why did they sail west at all? Because as they saw in the water, they saw debris coming from the west, they also saw birds. So they understood that there had to be something out there, these birds are coming from somewhere, and the debris in the water has to be coming from somewhere. So that's why they sailed west. About the year 800, again, Evidence is, we have archaeological evidence, but no really pinpointed. But about the year 800, the Vikings arrived in Iceland. In Iceland. And they settled Iceland. They settled there. Uh, not many of them. One of the things that these people encounter, of course, is that the, uh, the lands here are pretty fragile. I don't know if any of you have ever seen Iceland, but it's not a country that can support a large population, particularly in days of agriculture so that it couldn't support a large Viking population. About the year 900, one of these Vikings, a man named Eric the Red, uh, ran into some difficulties with local authorities and was apparently exiled out of Iceland and told, go west, get out of here. And he did. But again, he's not going, he's going in a direction that they think there is something because look here between Iceland and Greenland, which we'll see in a moment, not a vast distance. So you can imagine standing on the shore of Iceland, seeing birds flying from the west, seeing debris in the water. So Eric the Red, with a number of vessels, exiled from Iceland, heads west. He heads west and finds Greenland. He sees this, Eric sees this, sort of as an opportunity for real estate development. Greenland, you could probably call it white land. You might want to call it gray land might want to call it icy land, rock land. But if you've seen Greenland, you wouldn't think of it as Greenland. But Eric wants to attract people there. So he calls it Greenland. He returns home to Iceland, and he tells people he found this green land. And that begins a Viking migration, a Norse migration to Greenland. And they establish communities along the south shore of Greenland, the south and southwestern shore of Greenland. These Viking settlements are going to be in Greenland for almost 500 years. Now think about that for a minute. Wait, what year is starting? Around 900 to 1000, okay? So we're talking about a very long period of time. They are here in Greenland 500 years before before Columbus. Before they're here 500 years before Columbus. It's really a remarkable story. Yeah. So what happened to the Vikings? Well, that's a great question, what happened, because we know they weren't there. By, by the time uh, 1500, thereabouts, uh, we know that there are no Viking settlements uh, in Greenland. Again, the evidence is uncertain. It would seem that a couple things happened, Madeline. One is perhaps the climate change. It got colder. We know that from, from evidence, from uh, climate evidence, from climate history, that in, they have the Little Ice Age, as it's called. So it probably did get colder in Greenland, which, of course, would impact uh, domestic animals, dom uh, agriculture, etc. They may have been uh, marauded, attacked by pirates and, and others. There are lots of people who begin in the 14 and 1500s. There are lots of vessels sailing through there. They might have uh, attacked and sacked some of these towns. There's also something else that's curious and relates back to our friends, the Portuguese. Uh, one of the big exports from Greenland, what, what do you think they, the Greenlanders would be sending back to Iceland and back to Scandinavia? No, no, no. Well, no, Scandinavians have enough ice of their own. But what might they send back? What's, what's value? Well, fish to somebody. Huh? Certain types of lumber, maybe? Not so much lumber, because they don't trees. Walrus tusks, ivory. Ivory is really quite valuable. But then, the Portuguese, as you know, in the 15th century, the Portuguese pushed down Africa, and what can you get out of Africa? Elephant, Elephant tusks. tusks. So, the Portuguese find a greater supply of ivory and cheaper. And it's, it's likely then there's this kind of an economic impact here. The Portuguese in Africa have an economic impact on 
this struggling little community or communities there in Greenland. While these Greenlanders, though, are living here, they too look to the West. One of the things, and one of the things, Matthew, that they do lack in Greenland is timber. So they're looking for a source of timber, timber for building, timber for fuel, and they sail west looking for timber. Again, the birds, the debris. And as you can see, not a very long distance as they sail west, and they encounter North America. The first of the Vikings uh, to encounter North America is the son of Eric the Red. He's called Leif Erikson, Leif the son of Eric. And it's Leif Erikson who ventures west and we know encounters North America. He probably went first to Labrador, which is up on the upper coast here. Uh, didn't find much in the way of timber there. That's a pretty desolate coast. And so he sailed further south until he would find he's looking for a reasonable place to, to live and, and resources, agriculture, etc. And he finds it. He finds it. On the north, on the tip of Newfoundland, the island of Newfoundland, on the northwest corner, in a little peninsula that juts up, there is a place called Ans La Meadow. In the 1960s, uh, Scandinavian archaeologists began to look in this area. Now it's interesting how they decided to do this. They looked at maps from the 14th and 15th century of this part of the world, primitive to be sure, primitive to be sure, but these maps did show in, in gross outline something that looked like Newfoundland. They then began to apply kind of common sense. If you were sailing west from Greenland, what would likely be the first place, looking at tides and currents and winds. And so they sort of narrowed it all down, and they came to this place called Ansla Meadow and began excavations. And this is what they found. They found the archaeological remains of the Viking settlement on Newfoundland. This is Leif Erikson's settlement. What you see here is a reconstruction of the homes. Parks Canada, the Canadian equivalent of the American National Park Service, now administers this site. A remarkable place. I, I've been there several times and I, I, I really, if you have an opportunity, it's a little out of the way, that's for sure, but if you have the opportunity to visit it, it really is quite remarkable to come here and see the actual archaeological site of people who lived in North America, Europeans, not natives obviously, Europeans who lived here in the year 1000. And this is a reconstruction of the kind of huts that they lived in. And here's one of the archaeological digs. You can see, by the way, just in the distance, the shoreline. It's a gentle, sloping shore. It's green. I took these photographs in the summertime. I'm not sure what it's like in the winter. But you can see it's a sort of a welcoming place. It doesn't look harsh or hostile. And so they settled here then. They lived here. Now, let me go back here for a moment. The question might arise, but they're not there now. Uh, what happened? Why, why didn't they stay? We think they stayed here in Ansla Meadow probably not more than a couple years, so it wasn't a long settlement. But there are some things we know about this settlement, again, from archaeological evidence. We know, for example, that women were here, which sort of indicates that somebody might have been thinking about a relatively permanent place. We, how would you think we might know that women were here from archaeology? Yeah? Like remains of different types of clothing. Clothing, but also what we found, or I should say way what the archaeologists found, were the remnants of a spinning wheel. Spinning wheel. Okay. The Norse warriors didn't spin, but their wives did. So we know that women were here, and other archaeological remains too that you, you've just identified, indicate clearly that they were here, and f here for a period of time. Now, what happened? Why, what, why didn't they stay? Well, think for a moment. These Norsemen are fine warriors, no question about that, and they have metal weapons. They meet natives called the Inuit, or as the Vikings called them, they call them the Skraelings. These were native peoples. The native peoples were still in the Stone Age. But when you think about the encounter here of two cultures coming against one another and their capacity to defend or to attack, 
the Viking weapons, while metal weapons, were not far superior to the weapons that the Skraelings had. Hatchets, spears, bow and arrow. And there were more Skraelings than Vikings. And so it seems likely then that the Vikings could not sustain themselves against the hostility of the Skraelings. That's going to change in about four or five hundred years for Europeans, isn't it? What's going to make it possible for a relatively small number of Europeans to sustain themselves against hostile peoples? Yeah, Mackenzie? Guns. Guns. Gunpowder. Cannon. Muskets. But the Vikings don't have that. They don't have that technology. But it will be the development of that kind of war-making technology. Yeah. I was going to say Thanksgiving. Hmm? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, what do you mean? Oh, 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 good point. Very, yeah, 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 a good point. Uh, this is not particularly rich agricultural country, right. So they would, unless they had good relations with the Skraelings, who would know how to hunt and gather, it would be very difficult for them to survive. You're right. And they did not have. Uh, a little sidebar here, though, for a moment. Uh, recent archaeological excavations in the late 20th, early 21st century, farther north in the Arctic, we find among Inuit settlements, European goods. So, on one hand, the hostility between the two, but it also seems that for over a period of time, maybe hundreds of years, maybe hundreds of years, the Vikings, first in Newfoundland and then in Greenland, actually are trading with the Inuit in the Arctic. So there is, a, there is an interchange there. There is an interchange. The archaeological evidence would seem to indicate that. Then people always say, well, didn't the Vikings come farther south? Uh, the answer to that is probably not. Every once in a while, someone will come up with some kind of theory, you know, uh, that the Vikings were in New England, or the Vikings were in Rhode Island, or someplace like that, or the Vikings were in Minnesota, not the football team, but the original Vikings. Uh, that doesn't seem to have much substance. We know for certain, without question, they're in Newfoundland. We know they were trading with the Inuit in the Arctic. But then it goes away goes away. By 1500, roughly 1500, the Vikings are no longer, no longer either in Greenland or certainly not in North America. So it's an astounding story about their accomplishment. Of that there's no question. But as historians, we have to sort of ask, so what was the long-term impact? And the answer to that is probably not much because no one else really knew about this. There was no sustained settlement, no big or important cultural interaction here. An extraordinary achievement, yes, but in terms of impact upon the settlement and, and the evolution of North America, probably not terribly important. Yeah? When did Europe um, find out that there was contact with the West? I'm sorry, again, please? When did you know, Western Europe Oh, that's a great question. That was when, when did, or, or, let me rephrase that slightly. Did the other Western Europeans know about the Vikings yeah. in Greenland, Iceland? Green the answer to that would seem to be yes. Uh, they knew inferentially, uh, but they, they would, for example, there was European trade with Iceland. So uh, French, Spanish, British sailors did go to Iceland. And it's probably true that when they're in Iceland, they might well have heard stories about something to the west. But again, we have no really hard evidence of that. Common sense would tell us that sailors would tell stories to one another. So it's possible. For example, Christopher Columbus, about whom we'll come to in a minute, did apparently visit Iceland during his early stages as a, as a sailor, as a trader and a merchant. Uh, and one can speculate. Uh, when Columbus was in Iceland, did he hear about these stories from the west? Maybe, maybe not, but you'd have to ask yourself, he doesn't speak Icelandic, so could he even understand? And also, as we'll see in a moment, Columbus wasn't looking uh, to find Greenland, North America, or Iceland. He had entirely different motives. But yes, the Europeans did hear the stories, the oral tradition. Yes, they did hear the stories. No question about that. But again, historical impact, probably fairly minimal. But not so for this guy, Christopher Columbus. 
I need to warn you about one thing. Christopher Columbus, we don't have a clue what he looked like. <laughs> this could be Christopher Columbus, could be almost anyone from this time period. We have no life portraits of Christopher Columbus. So everyone, you can imagine him in any way you want, in any way you want. He's born in Genoa, Genoa, Italy, 1451. His father's in the wool business. The wool business in the Mediterranean, that time period, means travel by sea. And so at an early age, Columbus, young Christopher, goes to sea in this wool business. He seems to enjoy it, seems to be pretty good at it, and he takes up the life of a sailor. Uh, we know that he sails to Portugal. There's the place to go, right? Think about this. Late 15th century, what do you think's going on down on the waterfront of Lisbon? What are they talking about? What do you think they're talking about down there? Hmm? Hmm? They're talking about India, they're talking about China, they're talking about the exploration of their captains who are coming back with more news. They're talking about all these exciting things which, which Columbus hears. Columbus also watches these Portuguese and sees how they navigate, how they use the compass and the astrolabe. He takes courage from them, because these are men, the Portuguese, who are able to make long voyages and come back. That's the important part, isn't it? Long voyages out, but they come back. From them, Columbus learns about what sea stores do you take? I mean, what lasts on a long trip? Think about that. If you're going off on a hiking trip into the Appalachians, okay, what do you bring that's going to last and not go bad? Not an unimportant question. So what, go, what ship stores won't spoil? Okay. What kinds of vessels to use? Okay. What kind of techniques? How to sail them? All of these. And Columbus learns, just absorbs all of this from his Portuguese shipmates. You had a question, Matthew? Oh, no, I was just Okay. Absorbs all of this from his Portuguese shipmates. Learns how to handle these caravels. When we talked about these type of vessel, we talked about the Portuguese, that they're very handy and weatherly and seaworthy. Learned how to, to sail close to shore in and out, how to master the sort of long distance voyages that the Portuguese were accustomed to making. He also knew about the larger vessels, when he talked about the Carac, okay, and what their capabilities were. He learned how to handle men. Again, where do you learn about that? How are you going to handle a crew on a long voyage? What are the, what are the techniques? What about discipline, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things he's learning and observing and participating in from the Portuguese. Well, where does Columbus get the idea of sailing west to come to the east? He gets it again from the general knowledge of the time that the world is round. Columbus, who by this time experienced navigators, also a pretty good chart maker. He learned that from the Portuguese too. Columbus begins to calculate the size of the earth. I mean, how big is this ball? And Columbus comes up with an estimate that is grossly inaccurate. <laughs> he comes up with an estimate of the size of the Earth, which is considerably smaller than it actually is, which, of course, is a good thing for him, of course. If Columbus knew the true size of the Earth, he would know that what he proposed to do, sail west to come to the east, was impossible. So he sort of shrinks the Earth. He also, of course, doesn't know what else doesn't he know about. Okay? He can shrink the size of the Earth, but if you're sailing west to get to the east, there's land. There's land. There's something called North America, something called South America. Yeah, and he has no knowledge of that. None. None. He just thinks it's ocean between Europe and China, and then shrinks that ocean. So Columbus comes up with his proposal. He tries to peddle his wares. He needs sponsorship. He needs someone to finance what could be an expensive voyage. You know, it's like going to the moon, okay, going to Mars, costs money. So Columbus has to find the money. He goes first to this man, Henry VII, Henry Tudor, King of England. He's known as the biggest skinflint in Europe. Okay? Henry VII listens and says no. So Columbus then decides, well, England is not going to sponsor the voyage. So he goes other places. He tries Francois I, King of France. Uh, but the French, uh, the French nation at this particular time is somewhat in crisis, and Francois I is not willing to support him either. And so Columbus begins to uh, go and visit with other people. And here you see a wonderful little depiction. 
here's Columbus uh, making his proposal to a group of people. He goes to Portugal and makes his pitch to the Portuguese. The king of Portugal, and now these are people who know seafaring, the king of Portugal decides that he's going to do what executives always do when in doubt. What does an executive do when in doubt? Yes, exactly, exactly, Eighty. You call in your, your form a committee, hire a consultant, okay? Uh, and that's what you see depicted here. Uh, Columbus making his proposal and the king's consultants looking it over. Okay? Uh, the king of Portugal and the Portuguese are skeptical. Again, not skeptical that you can sail to the west and come to the east. But also keep in mind, going to the Portuguese, so that they've already invested very heavily in the Africa route. And the idea of now going across the so the Portuguese are not keen to do this at all. Not keen at all. Columbus next tries the uh, Spain. Uh, Ferdinand, Isabella. Now, at this time, Spain and Portugal are rivals. Very serious rivals for trade and for other political reasons as well. And so Columbus makes his pitch. To the, to the Spanish court, and that's what you see here. Again, the consultants pondering and thinking and looking at the charts. The consultants came back with an opinion. They said, you've made the earth too small. They were right. They were right. The, the experts in Portugal and Spain were right. You've made the earth too small. But nonetheless, for Spain, there's something in it for them here, because if they can uh, outmaneuver their Portuguese rivals and get to the east, that's something they're very interested in. However, at this particular moment, 1491, 1492, and the Spanish have something else that is consuming them at this particular moment. King Ferdinand, Queen Isabella, are concerned about what in 1492? The Moors? Yeah, the Moors. Think about this. Spain has been at war with the Moors for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. As you know, the Moors conquered the Iberian Peninsula, and then gradually the various Christian kingdoms, there were multiple kingdoms on the Iberian Peninsula, gradually pushed the Moors back and back and back. Until, by the late 15th century, 1492, the Moors are confined to only one kingdom in the south of Spain, Granada. This is the end of the, what's called the Reconquista, the reconquering. It's the very end of this centuries-long struggle. And so the Spanish crown, Ferdinand and Isabella, want to finish this story. They need to finish this. And so they tell Columbus, our brother, the moment is not propitious. The moment is not, we're not, we're not saying no, the moment is not propitious. And then, what happens, Wyatt? Well, um, he's back on the drawing board. Well, no, not Columbus, so what happens in Spain? Oh, in Spain? In 1492. They finally um, reconquer the Iberian Peninsula? Yeah, yeah, the fall of Granada marks the end of this centuries centuries-long struggle. And so here's Spain now, sort of riding high, reconquered the Iberian Peninsula. This strong sense, this urge, missionary zeal, this militant Catholicism that has so infused this country. So the opportunity to thrust out to get to China, the sort of thing that Columbus offers, is very attractive. It fits into the psyche of the nation at that time. And also fits into the political and strategic motives here of Ferdinand and Isabella vis-a-vis -vis their Portuguese rivals. If this Italian navigator can find a route to the east that we can dominate, good news. And so Columbus is called back. I love this painting. <laughs> Isabella looks somewhat disinterested in all of this. Looks like she's half asleep. Ferdinand looks like he's looking at the ceiling. Uh, but here is Columbus. Again, we don't know what he really looked like, but as good as any, making his pitch. 
and Ferdinand and Isabella agree to support his venture. She didn't have to pawn her jewels. Okay. So, okay. Queen Isabella did not have to pawn her jewels to finance this expedition. Columbus is given a contract by the crown. He will be admiral of the ocean seas and viceroy of all the lands he discovers. Oh, they didn't know what they were doing. But he will be admiral of the ocean seas and viceroy of all the lands he discovers. They didn't know what they were giving away. They tell Columbus, we want you to go to the port of Palos, which is in southern Spain. Uh, again, for reasons that aren't quite clear, it would seem that the people of Palos had dead done something to offend Ferdinand and Isabella, and they were being punished. And the way to punish the people of Palos was to force the community to give Columbus three ships. Okay. That was the punishment, three ships that he would, be, that he would use for his voyage. And so Columbus goes to the port of Palos and makes arrangements. Well, think. A fellow shows up in town, an Italian fellow, speaking Spanish, but I suspect it might not have been the best Spanish. And now he's going to recruit a crew for three ships. And where are you going? Oh. I'm sailing out on the vast ocean there to get to the east. Has anyone done this before? No. Uh, have you done it before? No. Okay. There wasn't a line to sign up. Okay. People weren't rushing to sign on board Columbus's ships. So Columbus turned to get some local help. And he got some local help from the Pinzon brothers. The Pinzon brothers. They're the sort of, you know, ship brokers, personnel recruiters, uh, whatever you want to describe them. But they're the locals. And so it's the Pinzon brothers that help Columbus recruit his crew and prepare his ships for the voyage. Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492 with sailing ships that numbered three, the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria. Well, maybe, sort of, not quite, not quite. Uh, the Nina and the Pinta were small caravels, the kind we saw a few moments ago. Uh, the Santa Maria, better known as La Galicia, that was her nickname, was a Carac, and the, which is a larger vessel. And here you see the Santa Maria and, in the misty background, the Nina and the Pinta. And this is a very romantic view, obviously, of the departure of Christopher Columbus. Whether it was as ceremonial as this, who knows? It might have been just get on board and get out. Uh, but this indicates some great ceremony at which this admiral of the ocean sea, with his three vessels, is now bound for the Indies, for the Indies. Columbus, this chart maker, had a view of the world that the, if he sailed to the Canary Islands, okay, just off the coast of, of Spain, of Portugal, and then headed due west, he would bump into Japan in about 2,400 miles. That was his estimate. Now, if you look at a map of the globe, or look at a globe, you'll notice if you look at the latitude, remember we talked about you know, latitude the other day, that the latitude of the Canary Islands in the Atlantic and the latitude of the Japanese islands in the Pacific, within a few degrees, are, are roughly comparable. Okay, we've got a couple degrees difference, but roughly comparable. So from that point of view, Columbus has had, probably had a decent idea. I'll go to the Canary Islands. I'll pick up the latitude. Okay, the latitude. Remember, he can measure latitude with his astrolabe. So he figures if he can go to the Canary Islands, pick up that latitude, and just sort of head west, 2,400 miles later, I'll bump into Japan. That's the plan. Leaves Palos the 2nd of August and does indeed sail with his vessels to the Canary Islands. 
There are the canaries, they take on some more stores, water, fresh water, etc. And then they begin to head west along the latitude that Columbus feels will bring him to Japan. Well, the voyage takes, they're at sea for about five weeks, which might seem a long time to us, but in this age, in the 15th century, a five week voyage was not all that far. Crew gets a little nervous. What do you think the crew's most nervous about as they're sailing west? What do you think, Lowell? What would you be, if you were aboard, what would you be most nervous about as a crewman sailing west? Um, maybe weather, unexpected weather. Weather, okay. <clears throat> weather's pretty good, though. Uh, Columbus, well, we'll come back to that in a moment. But weather's not bad. Weather's okay. Yeah, yeah. Not finding land. Not finding land. That would be a problem. Yeah. Well, encountering other civilizations. Maybe encountering other civilizations. But just think of the very simple, simple concerns of a sailor. Yeah. Well, how about exact location? Like, how did he oh. know where he was? Well, good question there. Well, how did Columbus know where he was? Uh, remember, we talked about latitude and how they measured latitude, the inability to really get any kind of real fix on longitude. So what Columbus did is he estimated everything. Used that uh, hourglass, talked about turning the hourglass and using the hourglass to measure time, then the length of uh, how far the vessel moved in that length of time. That's how he did it. Very crude and quite wrong. Columbus is, when you look at Columbus's log, uh, his, his log is, is quite wrong. <laughs> quite wrong. Uh, so he didn't really know where he was, except, except for the latitude. So he wasn't there. But how, what would you, what would, Mackenzie, what would you worry about? Rough waters. Rough water, but what, what do you think about, yeah. Coming home. Coming home, right. Remember we talked about this for the Portuguese going down to Africa. Oh, this is great. What a great day for sailing, right? The wind's behind us. Oh, wow, great. But then we have to come home. And that's what they worried about. And so every day, the farther they went, the farther they knew they'd have to go home. That was their concern. And the crew began to murmur, began to murmur. Well, fortunately, fortunately, Columbus continued on. He was, if not the world's best navigator, he was certainly a courageous seaman. And this is Columbus at the rail of the Santa Maria. This might look familiar to you. Does painting look familiar to you? What about that face? Hmm? Yeah. That yes, that's George Washington. <laughs> this is Columbus. This is Columbus crossing the Delaware. Okay. This yes, this particular artist, you know. <laughs> Who else, you know? Columbus must have looked like Washington. Yes, it's uh, it's uh, Washington crossing the Delaware or Columbus crossing the Atlantic. Take your pick. Okay. But in any case, he is a brave and persistent sailor and a good commander. A good commander keeps order among his men uh, and among the three vessels under his command. The voyage, and here you see the, the first voyage, Columbus will all together make four voyages. He'll make four voyages. But let's just look at the first voyage, which is, which is at the top here, in the yellow. Sailing west. Boy, was Columbus lucky. He's sailing in August and September across this part of the world, the uh, kind of not quite the South Atlantic, but what, what, what does Columbus avoid? He's blessed. Hurricanes. hurricanes. Think about it. Now he didn't know. Columbus didn't know it was the hurricane season, but he's sailing in the hurricane season. No hurricanes. Now, at least he didn't encounter any. Very lucky. Does another wise thing too. As they're sailing west, they begin to see. Uh, uh, flotsam and st stuff in the water, you know, again, and birds occasionally. So, like the Vikings, I said, well, there must be land somewhere near. And he, Columbus is on a course that's nearly due west. Due west. And then he decides, because he's seen some stuff in the water that seems to him to be coming up from the south, so he veers course. Instead of heading due west, he veers uh, slightly to the south. That's a great move, too, even though he doesn't know it. What might have happened had Columbus continued on a due west course? What would he have encountered that probably would have caused him some difficulty? Not civilization. Not civilization. What's the great river that flows out of the Gulf of Mexico, around the southern, and up along the coast? Gulf Stream. The oh. Gulf Stream. Yeah, the Gulf Stream. And the Gulf Stream is a powerful body of water. If Columbus had continued on his westward course, he would have bumped into the Gulf Stream, and his vessels probably would not have been able to have counted 
the Gulf Stream. Gulf Stream would have carried him north, up past Bermuda, and probably, if he was lucky, probably back to Europe. So by turning south, making that alteration in course, he avoided the Gulf Stream. On the night of October the 11th, the lookout on Santa Maria calls down to the deck, Tierra, Tierra, land, land. He had seen, apparently, some distant fire or something like that. <laughs> uh, the next morning, October the 12th, Columbus is on deck. He sees land. And he had offered, uh, or the king, the king and queen had offered a prize to the first person to sight land. And Columbus then asserts that it's me. Okay. The lookout last night was seeing something imaginary. I saw land. Okay. Not the most generous fellow. But it is October the 12th, Columbus Day, and there is land. There is land. <laughs> it is one of the great moments in history. Uh, Amy, do you have a question? Oh, no. Oh. Guess what? Columbus had estimated that he had sailed how many miles from the Canaries at this point? 2,000. Yeah, roughly 2,400 miles. He was on the right latitude, right? It's got to be Japan. It's got to be the out islands. It's got to be the outlying islands of the Indies. Must be, because it fits my calculations. The right latitude, right distance, it's the Indies. It's the, an incredible moment in world history. Completely misunderstood okay, by those participating. <laughs> but an incredible moment. And then comes the landing, of course. Oh, I love all the depictions of Columbus Landing. You know, you can imagine him. Swords and decorations will be worn. Put on your fanciest clothes you got. We're going ashore. And here's one depiction, of course, the vessels off there coming ashore. Columbus claiming this land, of course, for their majesties, for Ferdinand and Isabella, holding the flag, the men in prayer. I love this one. This is one of my favorites. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Bahamas, the rock-bound coast of the Bahamas. Hmm? There aren't any rocks in the Bahamas. But here we can see Columbus struggling ashore amidst all of those rocks. Okay. Yeah, I me. Mean, um, is that why the, he called the natives the Indians? Because yes. He thought he was in the Indies. Precisely. He, the peoples that he encounters now, the native peoples that he sees, and will begin to see more and more of, he calls them Indians because we're in the Indies. Yeah. yeah. Had he been to Japan? No. Prior to this? No. Columbus had never, never been into. Had never, as far as we know, I'm pretty certain about this. Had never been in Asia. Never. Never, no. Unlike the Portuguese, some of the Portuguese had, certainly. But no, Columbus. Kind of assumed it was 2,400 miles away. Yeah, 20, that was his calculation, you know. That, that's, what I, that's what I calculated on the map, okay, on the chart. He calculated 2,400 miles. And again, because he shrank the size of the globe, and because he knew nothing about North America or Latin America, it seemed to him perfectly good. And, you can, and here it was confirmed. Confirmed. I'm here. I'm here. This is my favorite, of course. This is okay. <clears throat> here is Columbus with all the pink flamingos flying around. Okay, and by the way, here he is in army. Kind of looks like Gaunt, Don Quixote to me. Can you imagine kneeling in sand in armor? Okay. Yeah. But in any case, you, you begin to catch the flavor of uh, the, all the depictions of this really phenomenal moment. Here's one that's really sort of mystical. It always gives you the mystery of Christopher Columbus. Well, Columbus, uh, on his first voyage now, sails about. Okay? He goes from island to island now. He, and every place he goes, he does encounter native peoples. And as he encounters these native peoples, uh, he inqu inquires of them. You can imagine the difficulty in, in communication. And many of these native peoples have small gold ornaments, just trifling little things. Uh, but when the Spaniards see gold, okay, it immediately flashes into their minds that you know, we have discovered this immense potential, rich civilization. The truth of the matter was that the gold that they were seeing amongst these natives were gold trinkets that had been traded from, from the mainland, perhaps from um, the Mexican plateau where the Aztecs were. But it had taken generations for these gold trinkets. It wasn't as if there was a, a gold mine just over the next hill. And of course, whenever Columbus or his associates would ask the natives in however rudimentary way they would do it, uh, where, where, where did these riches come from? The answer was always the next village over. 
<laughs> They're always anxious to get rid okay. So you want to go to the next village over. Well, as they went to the next village over, it was disappointment upon disappointment because they, they didn't find the great Khan. They didn't find people speaking Chinese. Okay? They didn't see the fine silks and teas and porcelain, everything that they were looking for. None of it. None of it. None of it. On Christmas Day, 1492, the Santa Maria is shipwrecked on the island of Hispaniola, on the northern coast of the island of Hispaniola. Columbus puts the crew of the Santa Maria ashore and tells them, establish this town, we'll be back for you. The town becomes known as Navidad, Christmas, Navidad. Columbus then, with the Nina and the Pinta, returns to Spain. And this is Columbus returning to Spain to visit the court. Ferdinand and Isabella receiving their Admiral of the Ocean Seas. Now this is Columbus's greatest moment. It's his greatest moment. Because it is at this moment that everyone believes he's found the route to the east. Now it's a little disappointing, of course, when he brings back coconuts, rare tropical birds. He kidnapped a few natives. You know, that's a little disappointing, but don't worry. Don't worry, send me back, send me back, and I'll find the court of the great Khan. And so Columbus makes a second voyage. On his second voyage, he returns again. But this is getting to be a little disappointing now. Wait a minute, you've been out there twice now, and he comes back, and you still haven't given us any evidence that you've discovered the route to the east. Again, tropical birds and exotic plants, that sort of thing, but where's the gold? Where's the silk? Columbus is given a coat of arms, though, for his accomplishments. He is the Admiral of the Ocean Sea, and this is the coat of arms. Of course, the lion and the ramparts, the anchors to symbolize his seagoing, and of course, the islands, the Indies, the Indies, the Indies. Christopher Columbus, Admiral of the Ocean Sea. He goes on a third voyage, getting a little Frustrating now, he takes his young son Diego with him on the third voyage. Uh, explores more, he's, he's setting foot on, on other islands. In fact, by this time, he's actually set foot roughly on the coast of Venezuela. So Columbus has set foot in the Western Hemisphere, not just the islands of Cuba and Hispaniola. But again, the results are very disappointing. Very, very disappointing. He'll make a fourth voyage and then return with more charts and more islands, but no evidence, no evidence at all. What, what is this, people ask, what, what is this that Columbus has found? What, they're not sure. They're, at this point, they're simply not sure. They still want to believe it's the islands just off the coast of Japan and China. The evidence is getting pretty thin. Columbus returns home. He does not make any fourth voyage as his last voyage. He retires to a, uh, a monastery. He's a man, really, in disgrace. Uh, great hopes, great plans, but at this point, nothing, or very little, very, very little. He still believes, firmly believes, of course, that he's found the route to the Indies. Columbus dies in 1506, a broken, unhappy man, again feeling that somehow he has failed, and others think he has failed as well. When he dies in 1506, he's buried in the city of Valladolid. Some years later, his son, Diego, who had been made governor of the island of Hispaniola, thinks that his father's remains should be moved from Valladolid to Hispaniola, to the city of Santo Domingo, today in the Dominican Republic. And so Columbus's remains are moved to Santo Domingo, the cathedral there, and honored. In 1795, in one of those European treaties, the island of Santo Domingo is turned over to the French. Well, we don't want a Spanish hero, even though he's Italian, buried on French territory, do we? So 
So they exhumed the body. And they moved Columbus to Havana. Well, that's good for about 100 years, till 1898, okay. the Cuban Revolution, Spanish-American War, and Cuba becomes a free country. Well, we can't have Columbus in Havana, can we? No. So they exhume him again and move him to Seville. And this is the tomb of Columbus in Seville, buried in great pomp, grandeur. Ah, but wait a minute. Did we get the right guy? In an archaeological dig around the cathedral in Santo Domingo, archaeologists find a box. It's labeled Columbus. This isn't good. This isn't good. And so there's this controversy now, this big controversy. In Santo Domingo, They've erected this monument, lighthouse, monument. This is, this is where they now claim Columbus is buried, because that box is asserted that when they exhumed the body in 1795, they got the wrong guy. Well, so what do you think we do in the 20, 20th and 21st century to settle this argument? You all watch CSI? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Is this or is this not Christopher Columbus? Hmm? DNA, of course, DNA, the solution to everything. We do have the we know where the remains of his family are, some of his sons, okay, so we can get accurate information. And so they do a DNA analysis with the body, with the remnants of the body, the remains in Seville. Turns out that in Seville would appear to be Columbus, the DNA. The Authorities in the Dominican Republic have yet to permit a DNA analysis of the remains here. So they still assert that's where Columbus is. So you have your choice. Seville or Santo Domingo, okay. which place is Christopher Columbus buried in? It's kind of ironic when you think about it, given the controversy of his life and all things that he did and didn't do, that even in death, even in death, Columbus is a mysterious figure. Good looking guy here. <laughs> Columbus, 1492, we know today, has found the route to North America. But that wasn't his goal. This guy achieves his goal. This is the Portuguese seaman, explorer, Vasco da Gama. He looks pretty ferocious. <laughs> I don't think I'd want to sail under his command. In 1498, Vasco da Gama, following that Portuguese route down along the coast of Africa, round the tip of Cape of Good Hope, into the Indian Ocean, it is Vasco da Gama who reaches India, 1498. He finds the water route to the east. And begins, of course, because of Vasco da Gama's, begins the great development of the Portuguese Empire in the east. And what about Columbus? What, what's he done? Well, we don't really know that for certain until 1519, 20, when this fellow, Portuguese, Ferdinand Magellan, set sail, passes under Latin America through the straits that bear his name today. Straits of Magellan, sails through the Straits of Magellan into the Pacific Ocean, this vast oceanic world. It is Magellan who crosses the Pacific, rise in the Philippines. In the Philippines is an encounter with native peoples, and Magellan is actually killed in the Philippines. But his crew and his ship continue their voyage, and get home. It is Magellan's voyage that establishes now, oh my heavens, it's a new world. It's not part of China. It's not part of Asia. It is, in fact, a new world. It is Magellan 
it is Magellan or his men who established that Columbus has in fact accomplished an extraordinary feat. That how do we emphasize how it changed the world? Okay. But that becomes known now. Columbus, of course, in the meantime, died 13 years before, completely unaware of what he had, had accomplished and feeling himself to be a failure. By 1500, others have come in now. Spanish, the island of Hispaniola, in Cuba, Puerto Rico. More Spanish are coming. You see, here, here is the difference between Columbus and the Vikings. People knew what Columbus had done, and people came after him. One of the things to consider that, that in Columbus's world they had that they did not have in the world of the Vikings that helped to spread information, what, what would be the most effective method that Columbus and his people had to spread information that the Vikings didn't have? What, what is it? Not the internet. <laughs> But what, 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 what was available in 1500 that wasn't available in the year 1000? That could spread information. Paper and egg. Hmm? Paper and egg. Printing. Gutenberg. Remember Gutenberg? Movable pot type? Did he? Yes. Think about that. I mean, we, we think of books today as so ordinary, right? Everything's online. But the point is, now information can spread very rapidly, relatively rapidly, and it does. And so Columbus's experience now, what he's is shared. And here you see, now we've yet, the Spanish have yet, by 1500, have yet to get to the mainland. That will come later with the conquistadores. But they are certainly probing about, probing about here in the, in the West Indies. By 1520, okay, 20 years later, you can see now how the Spanish Empire is in fact expanding here. And of course, if we carried this forward a few more decades, you'd see the creation of a great Spanish-American Empire. Yeah. So when did the uh, kind of colonization of North America? Oh, the, colon um, the colonization of North America doesn't really begin until early in the 17th, permanent colonization, until the early 17th century. Here you see the route that John Cabot takes in 1497. Uh, but it won't be until Jamestown. And there's some, St. Augustine is established. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to ask yeah. St. Augustine. Yeah, St. Augustine. 1565, St. Augustine. But we're some few generations away few generations away from permanent settlement on the North American continent. Think for a moment, what would the attraction be here? If you can come down here, Cortez, Pizarro, and the other conquistadores are finding these great kingdoms, these enormous civilizations, rich beyond measure. Okay? That's where the attraction is. Who wants to go up here? No. What's the attraction up here? Mm, at this point, not a lot. So, not a lot. Okay? You don't really want to go to Maine, do you? Hmm? Not in the wintertime. But down here, so... It'll take a while, but yes, we'll begin, to, but it'll be, it comes later. This is first. This is first. And here we see an example of the Spanish and Portuguese explorations between 1400 and 1600. And look at this. It's an incredible accomplishment. It is these navigators, these Spanish and Portuguese navigators, before the French, before the English, French and English are going to come into this business late. Late. When it comes to Europeans and European expansion, you can see Magellan, 1520. Cortez, well, Columbus, obviously. Da Gama, Cabral, Magellan, etc. Going, mastering the capacity now to sail to distant lands. This tremendous technological, emotional, physical triumph of being able to sail to distant lands. This is the beginning, the beginning of the establishment of this European expansion into other parts of the world. So, on October the 12th, remember Christopher Columbus. Don't remember that he took the prize. Okay, don't remember that. But remember what he accomplished and the sadness in the sense of his life in that he didn't understand the great triumph that was his. A any questions? Anything I haven't covered that you might uh, be curious about? Mm -hmm. Happy to answer. Yeah, sure. Why did they just go? They just went south? They didn't go north at all? I mean, who went south? Like, the farthest northern... Oh, Explorers, Cortez. Like, yeah. Why didn't they? Because there's nothing to attract them. Uh, that in the uh, 16th century, it's, it's the Incas and the Aztecs. This, this is where the action is. Here, and of course in India. But as they, and they do sort of poke around on the northern coast here a little bit, 
but there's nothing that attracts them there. Why, why would you come up here where it's, there aren't any great kingdoms, gold mines, silver mines? No, they're, they're rapacious to seize the wealth and treasure here. Okay, that's where they, yeah, Mackenzie. Um, wasn't Magellan like, he, well, he was the first one to sail under South America. Yeah. And wasn't First European. That, right. Wasn't that like a huge accomplishment because it was like really rocky waters? Exactly. Like in rough. And is that why the Panama Canal was built so that they didn't have to go all the way under? Right. Very treacherous navigation. You're absolutely right. And again, it speaks to Magellan's accomplishments as a navigator. Okay. Yes, very, very treacherous sailing around the tip of South America through the Straits of Magellan. Treacherous then, treacherous today. And very long. Very long. So you're right. In the 20th century, we build the Panama Canal, which cuts all of that off. Yeah, long. Magellan's crew settle Australia, or is that... No, converted? no, um, no, Magellan, you can see here, here's Magellan. They come into the Philippines. No, they don't set foot in Australia. They never touch Australia. And they come down through the islands, through Borneo and that area, across the, uh, uh, the Indian Ocean, around the Cape of Good Hope and back home. No. Australia is, Australia is going to be one of the la late discoveries, one of the later discoveries, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so St. Augustine was like the first one by the Spanish, but wasn't the French right after? Yeah, the, uh, it's John Cabot. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jacques Cartier. Uh, Cartier in the uh, 1530s, the 1530s, will be sailing here in the north. Uh, what Cartier and what Cabot are looking for is what, once the Europeans understand that there's something here called North America, okay, what they really want then is what, do you think? What do they want then? Once they find it, they want a way through it okay, because they're still fixated on getting to the east. So Jacques Cartier and John Cabot are looking for a water route, a water route that can get them through this obstacle. They, they view this as an obstacle. Okay. So they're looking for a water route through North America that can get them to the Pacific. Is there one, by the way? Is Northwest there a, Passage. Yeah. There is, there is a water route. Yeah. You can uh, go from the Atlantic to the Pacific by water. And it's, a, it's the Arctic route okay, called, you're right, Wyatt, called the Northwest Passage. Uh, which explorers will look for in the 18th and 19th and today in the 20th century. Just as a, a little footnote, this today, Northwest Passage, uh, is becoming perhaps more practical. As long as it was ice covered and only open for a very limited season, it wasn't very practical. But what's, what's working to make it more practical today? Global warming. Global warming. Global warming. So if we continue to have global warming, uh, you well, we can now send vessels through here, but it's still a little difficult because of the ice and the seasons. But if it continues to get warm and the ice cap melts, uh, you'll have a direct water passage across the top. Okay. Yeah. Are there records of how Magellan survived the voyage? I'm sorry? Are there records of how Magellan survived such a long voyage? Oh, yeah, yeah. His, to yes, to yes. His, his, uh, his pilot, his pilot. Uh, Magellan's pilot, and kept a very careful diary and a log. Well worth reading sometime, by the way. Uh, yeah, well, you can imagine that the real challenge that they have, what do you think would be one of the, uh, lots of challenges? But there's one challenge that on these long voyages that's going to bedevil these folks for a long time. It's a challenge of scurvy disease, uh, the scurvy being the lack of f uh, vitamin C, which comes from fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, and on these long, long passages, of course, uh, the men get, get ill and come down with scurvy, and tremendous losses. Uh, scurvy is a pretty pernicious disease, a deadly disease. And so they have to deal with that. You know. But Magellan is a superb navigator, but he does, unfortunately, he does get killed in the Philippines. Yeah. How sure. many men would typically be on a crew? Oh, that's a great question. How many men? Well, I can tell you this. On Columbus's three ships, there were approximately 97 men. <laughs> approximately 97. <laughs> that sounds a little too certain, but let's say close to 100 men. Uh, probably, given the size of the vessels, you would have maybe 40 men on Santa Maria, and then 30 and 30 on the others. Uh, you would probably take more men with you than you actually needed to run the vessel. And the reason for that would be you're going to lose some. You're going to lose some. So they were, when they left home, they were probably overmanned. That is, they had more than a sufficient number of men. But yeah, 30, 40 men. I've forgotten how many men were aboard uh, Magellan's vessel when she left. Uh, but uh, probably a, a fair number. They weren't, this is 50, 60 men probably. But then tremendous attrition and death. Yeah, yeah Matthew. Uh, with Columbus's crew, would you say that they were like really qualified individuals? Or since it was kind of like you know, penalizing their particular town, mm -hmm. were they more of a like, lower grade of mm -hmm. sailor? 
Great question about Columbus's crew. There's the old uh, wives' tale that they emptied the jails. You know, the only way they get people to go with Christopher Columbus was to empty the jails. Not true. Uh, in the 20th century, in the uh, 1930s, 40s, and 50s, there was this wonderful, wonderful historian. Her name was Alice Bache Gould. And uh, Mrs. Gould was an incredible researcher. Incredible researcher. Came from Quincy, Massachusetts, by the way. She was born in Quincy. Uh, and she spent years and years in the archives in Spain and elsewhere researching that very question. Of who were the men who sailed? And of the hundred or so men uh, that were aboard, uh, Alice Bache Gould managed to find the records. What an accomplishment of about 90 of them. I mean, just, just an incredible accomplishment. And from her evidence and her research, it would seem that, no, these were experienced seamen. These were, these were men who had been to sea before. Also, by the way, there's always the claim, well, there must have been some Irishmen aboard that made it all happen, you know? There must have been a Frenchman or an Englishman. No, no. Columbus was Italian, okay? But everybody else was Spanish, okay? All the seamen were, who were with him were Spanish. So they were good, experienced sailors, yeah. They weren't criminals, et cetera, et cetera. They were good, which probably accounts for the uh, sailing over and coming back, yeah. Good question. Other questions? I've kept you long enough, I suppose, huh? Don't forget, uh, we don't have a paper tomorrow, I'm sure. Actually, I don't think I probably have to remind you of that. Uh, and I'll see you uh, next week, so uh, have a great week. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History. Be sure to check out our Q&A podcast for intriguing hour-long conversations with people who are making things happen. A new episode is available every Sunday night. Find it and follow wherever you get your podcasts. Mm-hmm.